And we're going to be reading John 16, 21 through 22 in the NIV. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. I like to rephrase that and say she remembers, but it was worth it. <laughs> so with you, so it is with you. Now is your, a man must have written this. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I, just, I cannot help myself this morning. Okay. So it is with you. Now is your time of grief, but you will see you again, or but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Thank you, Amy. Moms know something about suffering, uh, and uh, that's why we honor moms today. You guys can go ahead and sit down. Oh, so good. Good to be with you guys today. We're in the, we've been in this series called God's Plan, and which is sort of a timeout, but sort of not. It's, uh, my prayer today is that if you're a mom, you will really appreciate today's message. My prayer is also that if you're not a mom, you'll still really appreciate today's message. Um, we're, moms know something about this, this whole experience with pregnancy, which is this dance between uh, suffering and beauty. Um, I, I'd say it this way. It's, it's a symphony of suffering that's, if you're a musician, you know about counterpoint. It's a second melody. Um, and so it's, it's a counterpoint uh, of, uh, that, of beauty, but it's a symphony of suffering. That kind of sums up uh, maybe our experience, maybe yours if you've, if you've witnessed it, but it's also so joyful. So I wanted to experience some of the joy uh, today in that. And so I actually set some of our home video with permission from my wife, edited for sensitive eyes. Um, and I want you to enjoy it. Uh, it's, it's set to music that kind of helps bear this out. So go. your breath hurt. Blue, <laughs> Great job. Good job, Corgi. Mm -hmm. 
Birthday, Corbin. cameraman uh, for the delivery was none other than uh, Ethan. Uh, I, I gave him a, something to focus on during that. So, um, But the reason, I want, the reason I wanted to show you this is because there is some of that emotion that I want you to actually adopt and interpret as we look at scripture. Is that okay? So it's not a stretch because actually Jesus actually used that. That actual scripture is from Jesus. Um, and so uh, I think it's, it's important as we talk about God's plan in the light of suffering. And the first thing we want to do is we just want to look at Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 and we're going to talk about a principle that God put in place. And understand this, the, the very first commandment, and we won't take time to go there, but the very first commandment, do you know what it is? First commandment found in Scripture is back in Genesis 1. It said, be fruitful and multiply. It's the very first commandment that God gave. And then we see uh, all the way up here in chapter 3 that so far this command has not been uh, obeyed yet. It hasn't been lived out yet. We don't see it yet. Um, and what we, we find out is that Adam and Eve have sinned. They've, 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 their shame and their sin has been uncovered. And um, now God uh, has something to say to them. We're going to see that in verse 16. And what we'll read here is a passage that some people will describe as the curse that was pronounced. But I want to um, address that in a moment. But verse, verse, verse 16, it says, To the woman, this is God speaking now, To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bear forth children, uh, bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You will eat bread. So the first principle that I want uh, to give you today, uh, we're going to look at two truths today, uh, and then we're going to look at some myths as it relates to those truths. So the, the, the first uh, principle we want to look at today is that God uses labor and suffering to bring about reproduction. Everybody say reproduction. Okay, so Mother's Day is kind of like we're celebrating reproduction. Yay, moms, you made a person. So, um, so, so scripture honors that, and, and it's a spiritual principle too. Um, this idea of reproducing and investing in another person spiritually is not a side mission. It is the mission um, and so I want you to understand this, though. So a lot of people will look at this passage and they will say, well, this is the part where God pronounces cur the curse on Adam and Eve. And he says, what well, the curse is going to be for Eve and the curse is going to be for Adam. I was talking to my sister about that the other day, and she, some, she was like, oh, my God, why? And so um, I want to challenge you because I want you to look at this. It, it, 
there really is no, in any place in this passage that, that God pronounces a curse on Adam or on Eve. It's not there. You will see that there's a curse that's given to the serpent just before this. And then right here, you do see one part where it says, cursed is the what? Cursed is the ground. And which is interesting because the ground, the Hebrew word for ground, guess what Adam gets his name from? Ground. Adam means ground. And so here we is, the, the ground, the symbolic stuff that Adam is made of is cursed as a result of the sin. And for sure, sin entered into the world and it changed everything. Instantly, Adam and Eve saw that they were exiled from the garden. The garden that, that was thornless, that required no maintenance, was now changed forever. And we see that Adam would suffer. But I want you to see something else here. This is not a curse. What God is doing is what he's always done, is he's making a way to partner with Adam and Eve to do what he asked them to do from the beginning. He's partnering with them. And that's what I would just say with you from the get-go, is that God isn't mad at you. He wants to partner with you. He wants to partner with you. And he's ready right now, no matter what you're going through or what you've gone through, God wants to partner with you. So he does that with Adam and Eve. And right here, you'll see it. Look at this in, in Genesis 4.1. She says, this is Eve now. This is just after this pronouncement is given. She says, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Isn't that cool? She senses God's presence in the middle of the suffering, and then she experiences the joy of her son. Uh, it's so cool. I love it. I love it. I love it. So God is partnering with us, and this is the new principle that God uses labor and suffering to bring about reproduction. Are you with me? Are you with me? That's good, because we got to unpack it, and it's an uncomfortable thing to unpack. But our response to that is this. We want to, as a, to respond to that truth, we want to embrace the discomfort that brings new life. Embrace the comfort that brings new life. Don't avoid it. Don't avoid the discomfort. Embrace it. So I speak to you out of a place of of identifying with everything that I want to speak to you about today. This is a season that I've been walking through, a season of, of suffering, a, a season of, of trying to avoid uh, discomfort and pain. It doesn't pan out. So the, the, the truth is that this is God's principle from the beginning. And the second principle is this. So God wants to multiply joy with the multiplied pain. God wants to multiply joy with the pain. God doesn't want to leave us in pain. Pain is not the purpose. Pain is the process. Pain is the means, but the purpose is, is, is the end result is joy. And it's, remember, Jesus said, I came and I have life and life more abundantly. That's where God wants to take us. But a lot of Christians, they get messed up here because they believe life more abundantly means I never have to walk through a season of suffering. Jesus promised. And so, um, so, so we get that twisted. And so here's the myth. The myth that messes us up along this, this scripture or this truth is that, and here it is, it's on the screen, the myth is getting what we want is the key to joy. Getting what we want. So we get tripped up. And I like, uh, you know, if you remember Apostle Paul, he wasn't always Apostle Paul, he was Saul, and, and God did a work in his life, and now he's on mission, man, he is, he is he's loving people, he's, he's building and planting churches, but... Just like all of us, he's human, and he has this moment where his plan and God's plan appear to be somewhat in conflict. Uh, there's something about what he asks God to do that God responds differently than how he expects God to respond. And I want to read it to you. This is from 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Uh, so to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations— a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, Hardships, persecution, and calamities. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. And as we read this, 
there's really only one way. If you read this honestly, and you're not trying to insert some sort of theology or doctrine into this, there's really only one way to read this, and that is that Paul had some kind of suffering. Something was hurting him in some way. It was irritating or bothering um, him, whether physically or relationally. Something was bothering him. He calls that a messenger of Satan to torment him. So it was really bothering him, it, right? And he asked God to remove it. And God didn't respond in the affirmative, but he didn't respond in the negative. He responded relationally. And he said, my grace, did you see that there? Let's read it together. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. So really, that's the only way to read that passage. And uh, I wanted, though, to kind of get some insight into this passage because I, 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 you know, without going into the details, definitely, personally, been walking through a season of suffering. And so I want to see, you know, what, did, what, and one of the first things I looked at when I looked at the scripture, uh, you know, what is Paul suffering with here? One of the first things I saw was that apparently many people believe that God can't be glorified in suffering. And if I'm not, according to this way of thinking, if I'm not, as a believer, living a pain-free life, if I'm not, as a believer, living a suffering-free life, if I'm not living, no way of saying, is my best life now, if I'm, not, if I'm not experiencing those things, then God's not getting the glory he deserves, and I'm not on mission. And, and I, I, this was part of the teaching that I, I, I read online, was that Paul may have erred when he asked God, when he pleaded with God three times to remove the suffering. What Paul should have done, according to this line of teaching, is Paul should not have asked God. He should have taken up his authority of a believer and commanded the suffering to be gone in the name of Jesus. And so he missed an opportunity to be delivered because he didn't take up his authority as a believer. Now, I want to say clearly that we affirm the authority of the believer. We affirm that God has given us authority in the name of Jesus and that we can take up arms against the enemy, and we will see people healed and, and people set free and people delivered. We believe all of that, and we want to affirm all of that, and I want to speak clearly to that. But you know, we also believe in the sovereignty of God. Did you know there is not a molecule of the universe that God is not sovereign over? Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Even the devil himself, and this is sticky theology, and I'm just going to throw it out there, but even the devil himself, remember, God created Satan. I mean, he didn't create him like he was. Satan fell. But even, even the things that Satan does, God takes the, the, the things that Satan does that are evil, and he takes them, and he turns them, and he says, no, 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 I'm sovereign. I'm going to use that for good. So remember that God is still God. God is still sovereign over everything. Paul didn't err. Paul didn't make a mistake when he asked God when he sought God for his will regarding the thing he was suffering in. Paul did the right thing. He partnered with God. He said, I'm suffering in this. I'm asking. And, and, and look, that's, that's a really cool thing is, is God responded to him in the affirmative and said, look, you're doing the right thing. My grace is sufficient. Let's partner with this together. Let's do this together. Uh, you're doing the right thing, Paul, and, and don't let the enemy trick you. I love that. I love that. And so we got to get that right when it comes to this issue of suffering. So remember, the, the myth is that getting my way is the key to joy. But here's the truth. The truth is submitting to God is the key to joy. I want to submit to God. So the, the, the two principles for the day are this, that God uses labor and suffering to bring about reproduction, and God wants to multiply joy along with the pain. But here's the second myth that will trip us up when it comes to labor and deliverance. Of course, this whole thing is about set in the context of, of pregnancy and a new life, uh, the myth is this, that deliverance is fast and easy. Deliverance is fast and easy. And one of those threads that I was looking at, this discussion on uh, different scriptures, and, and again, I want to just say one more time, we believe in healing as a church. We believe that God heals, still does it today. I'm so thankful that my wife is, has been miraculously healed from lupus. I remember the day that she found out that she had lupus and that we kind of mourned a loss in that moment. We, we kind of cried, and she thought, well, there goes my dream of nursing and uh, will I ever even see my, you know, my, my son graduate from high school? Um, you know, as a mom, that's hard. 
That's why I see why I'd be able to walk my son down the aisle. She said that because she was with her aunt. She cared for her aunt who passed away from lupus. She was, she cared for her aunt in her final days. And so, um, but you know, I'm thankful. God heals. God still does that today. I want to affirm that and say that. That being said, in some of these threads, I remember reading, and one of the, one of the things that kept coming over and over and over again is someone said, you know, hey, God doesn't need me to suffer. I'm a king's kid, and I refuse to suffer. God doesn't need me to suffer. So I rebuke that line of thinking. And I want to say about this, don't run, when you're in a season of discomfort, when you're in a season of suffering, when you're in a season of pain, see where God is at work. Partner with God, run to God, and say, God, what, what can you do with this? And then ask God, believe God for healing, believe God for deliverance, but remember that authority, we do believe in the authority of the believer, but remember there is, a, there is a name for authority without submission. It's called rebellion. <laughs> it's called rebellion, and it's, what, it's, it's, it's how we ended up with Satan to begin with. So, um, so we don't want that kind of authority. We want our authority to always, always, always be checked against God's sovereignty. It's never wrong. It's never wrong to say, to seek God's will. It's never wrong to, to submit ourselves. So deliverance, the, the myth is that deliverance is fast and easy. And the unintended consequence sometimes of churches that are wanting to uh, celebrate testimonies uh, is that we often want to go for the fully healed testimony, the completely restored testimony, the person that is on the other side, their financial house is in order, the kids are all wearing ties and you know i mean just that that's the that's the 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 group that we want to shoot for and the unintended consequence is that what happens when i have a thorn maybe 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 because i don't have a grip on this uh depression or maybe because there's a disability in my household or or maybe because uh, there's a disease that someone I love is suffering with or I'm suffering with or my marriage isn't where it should be or my kids are, 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 are struggling or, you know, uh, guess what? My finances are out of order. I, I, I guess I got to tap out for now because I'm not where I want to be. Not, things aren't where they should be. And so uh, instead of partnering with God in the middle of that suffering, we, we, we just take a time out. And maybe even worse, we step away from God. Maybe we, because of the disappointment, because of, of stuff that's going on, because we've been lied to, or maybe, in, I believe the intentions are right. The intentions to say, come on, believe God. Believe God, which is always right. Believe God, but also don't claim it. Ignore it. Don't look at it. Pretend it's not there. And whatever you do, don't talk about it. And that, what does that do? That puts us in an unhealthy place, church. We don't want to be in that place as a church. And also, you know, it, it's great for the moment, but what happens when you've been taught that, you know, God will answer whatever you, you know, remember Jesus said, whatever you have, and he asked in faith, it is yours. You'll move mountains. Your faith will move mountains. And remember James, he said, whatever you ask in faith, nothing doubting, don't be a double-minded man, and double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so as you try to be obedient to that, that, all of a sudden you pray a prayer and the prayer doesn't, I'm just being, can we be honest? Is this, it's, it's gutsy, but can we be real honest in church? What happens when you pray that prayer and then it doesn't come? And man, you believed and it doesn't come. And so what happens then at that point, what happens is, and I've struggled with this, so I'm just speaking to you out of the struggle that, I, that now I, I, it's, 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 I'm reconciled with all of this, so I just will give that to you. But um, when I saw that double-minded man is unstable, all it means, what's that mean? Of faith, nothing doubting. And I, for me, here's what that means. And you'll work this out in your own salvation, but here's what that means. In faith, nothing doubting. In faith, nothing doubting the person that I'm praying to. I don't have faith in faith, and I don't even just have faith that what I said is going to happen. I have faith in the God that I am praying to. He is the one that I have faith in. Nothing doubting. Nothing doubting. So even when it doesn't manifest, nothing doubting. Even like Job, even when you slay me, so will I serve you. Nothing doubting. That's the nothing doubting faith that we want to honor here at church and River Church. And I think here in America, you know, again, we pray in faith. But I think the American church has this habit of honoring 
this type of, of, of faith person, the person who has it all together, man, they, they look good, they sound good, they're eloquent, and everything just gets better and better for them day after day, or at least, you know, the, from the external. But uh, the thing is that globally, glo- the global church and the historical church doesn't look anything like that, y'all. As a matter of fact, the faith of our ancestors uh, and the faith of our brothers and sisters across the water their faith looks something like this. They have every reason to doubt, every reason to be in fear, every reason to have anxiety, every reason to struggle. As a matter of fact, on a, on a day, they have a daily opportunity for all of these things to overwhelm them completely, and yet they are white-knuckling in prayer and begging God and believing even when stuff hasn't happened. That is a real global picture of faith. So, what do we do with that? We, we fix our eyes on things above. That's what we do. That's the, that's the scriptural imperative. We fix our eyes on things above. So even when we're going through suffering, we can walk in that truth that God still uses suffering today to accomplish his purposes. And it doesn't mean that I'm no, <laughs> I'm no longer valuable or I am now tapped out. It means God is working. That's cool. This hurts, so God is working. This hurts, so God is on the move. When a woman has contractions, does that mean something's gone wrong? No, it means this is right. This is good. I remember Rosemary, she would be like out walking, like, you know, she never walked like she walked when she was trying to get those contractions started. It was like, you know, uh, I got just miles, you know, of this, like just trying to get that, uh, Get those contractions going. There's nothing wrong. That's good. So he, Hebrews 11:39 is a cool chapter. Hebrews 11 itself is a great chapter, but verse 39 sums up the whole chapter. You go read it because it's super cool. I would recommend you do it today. Today, read chapter 11. But look at verse 39. It sums it up. And the, and the cool thing is that the, the whole chapter is like honoring people who prayed and God did things and people who prayed and the the things didn't happen. It's like both of them are mixing together, which is super cool. And then verse 39, it says, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better. Maybe just put that on a, you know, on your mirror or something, but since God had something better. So the myth is that deliverance is fast and easy, but the truth is that deliverance may not be fast or easy, but it's always timely. It's always timely. Timely meaning in God's time. God has a season. God does things. He's a God of order. And God put a mathematical value of the number 10 on Eve's suffering. Nine, I'm sorry, nine. Nine months. Uh, nine months of, of suffering that she would go, walk through. So for you, there's a, there's a number, there's a value on some of the suffering that you're walking through. That doesn't necessarily mean that God is orchestrating it, but here's what it does mean, that God will turn that suffering into glory. Always it means that. You know, sin is involved, Satan's involved, things are happening, but remember, God is sovereign. That's why I always come back to it. God's sovereign, he's in charge, he's in control. Nothing's happening apart from his view. Nothing's happening apart from his view. He sees you. He knows you. Myth chapter, or I'm sorry, myth, uh, myth number three. Uh, myth number three is that Jesus suffered, so I don't have to. I want to say that gently because I, it's not a complete myth. It's also partly true. Jesus suffered, so I didn't have to. Like, for example, we see in Isaiah um, that by his stripes we are healed. Speaking of Jesus and other verses that talk about the healing that is afforded to us, it's part of the package. You know, healing is part of the redemption package that was afforded to us on the cross. But also, it comes with it some of the things we already referred to, which is if Jesus suffered so I don't have to, then when I f- start to feel something hurting, I tap out. I'm out. And this is why, friends, this is why the American, the American church and American Christianity is on the decline as a whole. This is why, because we tap out. Um, and I can say this because I'm, I'm American and I'm American Christian. I don't think our brothers and sisters across the sea would say this about us. They love us. Actually, uh, they send missionaries to us. Um, and so, uh, 
It's true. It's true if you didn't know that. It's true. And we need them. <laughs> It's funny because if you've ever been a missionary, if you've ever served, you're all, you go there like thinking you're going to be the hero, and then you show up and you're like, y'all are awesome. Y'all are really awesome. Like, I needed this in my life. So, um, uh, I, I would think that here's what that I think they probably believe about us, because I believe it about us, that we are more or less, ba- spiritually speaking, bachelors who want to prioritize our careers and uh, pleasure and live a kid-free life, a spiritually kid-free life, um, because kids are messy. And, the, the, again, that symbolism, spiritually speaking, of, of discipleship is hard, and, and nobody wants to be pregnant, especially not in Phoenix in July. <coughs> um, and so... Uh, God bless you, moms, you Phoenix moms. Um, but, uh, but, but the Christ follower takes that authority that we have in, in Jesus, and then we submit it to the cross, and we say, but, but I'm a Christ follower, doggone it. I'm American second. I'm a Christ follower first. And so I want to be like Jesus. Well, how did Jesus teach us to pray? And this, this I'm just going to tell you, this culturally rubs up against some of the teaching that we hear maybe in churches on a Sunday. Um, And I am not against, uh, by the way, uh, live your best life. I'm okay with living your best life now. And the teacher who's made famous for that, I love him. Yeah, I'm not here to hate on him. I I do. I love him. I'll listen to him uh, uh, frequently. I'm not, this is not a slamming message, okay? I want to, I want to be clear. That being said, that's not why Jesus died on the cross. Jesus didn't die on the cross so you can live your best life now. Jesus died on the cross. What uh, Tyrone said it last week, and he's, we've been saying it all along. The mission is this. God's plan is this, uh, to know him and to make him known. That's what life is about. That's God's plan. That's God's will for you. If, you're li- if your best life now interferes with knowing him and making him known, then, uh, then, then cut that plan loose. Don't live your best life now. Um, so, um, so again, let's look to Jesus. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6? Um, he said, here's how he taught us to pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. So kingdom first. We're all about kingdom first. There's two kingdoms. We want to have his kingdom first. Mark 26, 39 says, um, this is Jesus now modeling that prayer out while in suffering. He said, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will but as you will. Again, Jesus is modeling this. Again, what we said earlier, authority without submission, well, that's, that says not that will, but mine be done, which is not how Jesus modeled that for us. We wouldn't maybe say that prayer out loud that way, but maybe we live our lives that way. Maybe that's the way that we respond when an opportunity shows up to serve in church or, or to, to grow in our faith or to disciple someone. That's how we respond. Um, but Christ followers live their lives seeking God's plan. First, uh, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. Let's read that together. I love how Paul says this in regards to the, the stuff that he's been up against. He says, yes, I will rejoice, for I know, everybody say, I know, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. I love that. I hate it when shame robs us of what God is doing in our midst. So I love it. He says, I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored. Say that. Christ will be honored. Say one more time. Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the Christ follower attitude, y'all. It just says Christ will be honored. So the myth is that um, the Jesus suffered so I don't have to. And the truth is that Jesus, I I would say a more complete way of saying it is, Jesus suffered so that when I do suffer, I will be more like him. Because that's ultimately what it's about. I want to know him. And you know that scripture that says I want to know him says, I want to know him 
and be made like him. I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. Um, uh, it's not in my notes, but you can go check that out. Google it. All right, so um, authority without submission. Again, we don't want to be involved in that. So God's plan is to know him and to make him known, which is discipleship, which we're all about. Um, so uh, Jesus suffered so that when I suffer, I can be more like him. Hebrews 12, 12, looking at Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, everybody say joy, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In Jesus, you guys, we see an approach that isn't pain avoidant. It's not, it's not an avoidance-based um, re- faith. He's not, he's not shrinking from what, what the situation is, but he's entering into God's plan, and he's believing with joy that the pain is going to bring a result. So the apostle, the apostle Paul, as a Christ follower, he did the same thing. He adopted that mentality the same way. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. I will boast of the things that show my weakness. He was talking about all the things he could boast about. And then he said, you know what? Time out. Let me boast about the things I should boast about. I'm going to boast about my weakness. And then verse 24, he says, five times I was received at the hands of the Jews, the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers. I said in first service, Paul Danger is his middle name. Um, Paul the Danger Apostle, danger from uh, false brothers in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food in cold and exposure. Man, why didn't he just command food why didn't he just command that the ship be uh, the waters like jesus did why didn't he just command the waters of that shipwreck to be calm and and the ship would settle safely well sometimes we command and then sometimes we submit and that's what paul demonstrated here because he did do that he did command and people were made whole but then sometimes um, vipers jumped out of the fire and bit him on the arm. And then, you know, you just pray and say, okay, hey, God said, Jesus said, it's going to be okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to trust him. So what was the result of all of Paul's sufferings? He lists all of these things. By the way, why was he suffering? To multiply. He was being, he was being obedient to God's original command to be fruitful and multiply. And then he was be obe- being obedient to Jesus' command to build the church when he said, when he gave the great commission to go, in a sense, to go and to be fruitful and multiply the the message that Jesus had given. And so uh, I I love, what was the result of all of that? The result was, was you see it throughout all the epistles, the epistles of the writings of of Paul, the apostle to his his spiritual children. And um, I don't know, I don't know that Paul ever had uh, earthly children. I don't know if he did or didn't. Um, but I do know that he had a ton of spiritual children. And I know that I'm one. And here, here we have in Philippians 1, 3 through 5, one, one account. He says, I thank my God. Remember back to that video? Remember all the joy that I showed, you know, the, you know my kids? It's just this, this holy moment, this beautiful moment, right in the midst of all this suffering. I mean, there's probably still blood spots on the floor if we're being real. Um, but, um, but, but right in the middle of all of that, and yes, my kids were in the room. Uh, so in the middle of all of that, um, we have this joy and here we, I see it here. If, if three through five, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Can you feel the emotions there with, with Paul the Apostle? Can you feel it? I love it. It's so cool. And he's, he's writing this. Guess where he's writing this from? You, you guys know, right? He's writing it from prison. Um, and he's just so thrilled with the idea that the, the, 
believers in Philippi are living out and walking out the truths that he's laid down as he followed Jesus himself. So our two principles, God uses labor and suffering to bring about reproduction and multiplication. And God wants to multiply joy in the middle of the pain. Are you hurting today? God wants to bring inexplicable joy on the other side. Are you a Christ follower? Remember that Paul, Paul experienced multiplied joy through those he discipled. It really is the heart of this message today because ultimately it's the heart of the, the, the gospel message. We want to be about the business of investing into others. And what you get on a Sunday morning is not about you. It's about what you do with that as you invest into others. So, first question is who are you discipling? Man, let's get about it. Let's be about it, church. As I, as I conclude, three, three um, assessments that I have about the church at, here in America in particular um, is that we want the dawn without the darkest hour that precedes it. We want the resurrection, but without the cross. And we want the delivery uh, without the labor pains. And so the idea here, though, is that when we, we have an opportunity in all of those areas to partner with God, not run from the pain, not look away from it, but to invite God in, to invite God in. Oh, guys, let's invite God in. And as you do, remember that this, this theme is throughout Scripture. It's laced from the, I started in Genesis. Y'all, we can go all the way to the book of Revelation, and we can see that theme throughout. Oh, man, remember the Israelites, and they were, they were suffering in Egypt, and they were delivered, but through the birth canal of the Red Sea. Um, and, uh, man, just over and over and over again, we see the, this idea of, of Labor and delivery or deliverance is a scriptural, scriptural um, tie-in. It's something that we can adopt as part of our mentality. And we don't have to be surprised when we, when we encounter some suffering. It doesn't mean that we tap out. It means that we press into Jesus. And remember that he's there saying, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. You know, you got a thorn. That doesn't mean you got to stop dancing. Just dance with the thorn until Jesus heals it. Um, don't, don't, don't tap out. Partner up, you know. Grab a partner and, and do si do. Um, I don't know where that came from. God help me. God help me. I went country. I will never do that again. Never. I vow. <laughs> So one final scripture verse I want to, I love you. If you're country, I love you. You do not get to choose the radio station when we're in the car. Um, <laughs> but I love you, though. Uh, second, one final scripture verse, um, 2 Corinthians 4. For some of us, um, this whole thing of suffering will be fully realized. Think back to that video one last time. And there is a really deep spiritual truth that one day we will breathe our last on this earth. And that umbilical cord to this planet will be cut. And we will step into the glory of eternity. And the joy will not be contained. And all of the, this is the way, I get goosebumps, but this is the way the Apostle Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Would you stand with me? Mm. Just close your eyes. Maybe uh, posture yourself just to, in a way to receive. Maybe bow your head and, and focus, press past the external distractions and just kind of listen because God is speaking. And the first question I want to ask you, um, really, I just ask everyone this, this main question is that, is what, in what area is suffering going on, is suffering existing that you have not invited God to partner with you in? What, what suffering have you not submitted to God in? Um, 
And if you've been disappointed you'll, you'll, by God in times, you'll, you'll identify with that. And um, how can we ever be disappointed by God? I know y'all, but the reality of it is such that, that we are. <laughs> Even though God is good and his, his grace is unfathomable, and at the end, we'll, I mean, I fully believe that all those times that, that I, I was angry with God, I will... Um, <laughs> I will be so repentant and I will just fall at his feet um, and do even now still um, in relationship to those times. But I would just say, if you're here right now, here's our response. Our response is this, God, where can I partner with you now? Where have I not partnered with you in relationship to suffering? I know that you did that with Adam and Eve. I know you wanted to do it with me today. And secondly, if you haven't said yes to Jesus, I want to remind you that you have a father, a heavenly father that Jesus talked about nonstop. You have a heavenly father who is waiting. It's Mother's Day, and I know we all want to call our moms today. Um, but you have a heavenly father who is waiting for your call today. And he's so good. And he loves you. He's with you in your pain. And he has a purpose. He doesn't want to leave that pain um, uh, festering, but he has a purpose for it. And he wants to bring new life. That's what it's about. He wants to bring new life in you and in others. So if you're here and you haven't said yes to Jesus, the team's going to come. They're going to they're gonna start singing here, and we're going to respond in this song. I love this song. It's called New Wine, and it says, in the crushing, in the pressing, you're bringing new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. Maybe that's where you're at today. You want to say yes to Jesus or you just want to submit yourself to Jesus, here's my encouragement to you. Go ahead and do that now. As the, we'll have some prayer people up here at, at the front that will pray with you um, and believe with you uh, and help you surrender and say yes to Jesus and respond to him as you need to. But let's all do it together now.